Psalm 26, verse number one, we see, uh, of course, uh, in my Bible that I have tonight, it says the Psalm of David. This is one that David penned. A lot of people don't a lot of times consider that David did not uh, pen all of the Psalms, about half of them. But this is one of David's uh, Psalms uh, that he penned, of course, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. Verse one, judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord. Therefore, I shall not slide. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. For thy loving kindness is before mine eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. I have not sat with vain persons, neither will I go with, in with dissemblers. I have hated the congregation of evildoers, and will not sit with the wicked. I will wash mine hands in innocency, so will I compass thine altar, O Lord, that I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all thy wondrous works. Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place where thine honor dwelleth. Gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men. In his hands is mischief, and their right hand is full of bribes. But as for me, I will walk in mine integrity. Redeem me and be merciful unto me. My foot standeth in an even place. In the congregations will I bless the Lord. I'm gonna take for my title tonight a phrase that you find in the 11th verse. Because David begins and ends with speaking about integrity. I want to preach tonight on this thought out of verse number 11, where David says, I will walk in mine integrity. I will walk in mine integrity. Now, again, we've already said that this is a Psalm of David. Let me also say that the occasion for David writing this is that there was a, a great famine in the land. A three-year famine in the land of Israel, a great famine. And the reason for that famine, I want you to hear this, is because uh, judgment had come to the people because of Saul's sin. Now, hold that thought for just a moment. And why were they judged because of Saul's sin? Well, in the Old Testament, Joshua was deceived by a group called the Gibeonites. And uh, he made a treaty not to harm them. Saul the king violated that treaty and destroyed them. They broke uh, their word and he broke the word of God's people. And that's believed to be the setting of this particular psalm. And I want you to think about this for just a moment that a generation later now, famine comes uh, for three years. <clears throat> And this judgment came as a result of a previous generation's sin. Let me just stop right there and remind every single one of us that no man liveth to himself and no man dieth to himself. Amen. That the decisions that you and I make on a daily basis don't just affect us on a daily basis, but they will also affect the generation to come. Amen. They will affect our children and they will affect... Our, our grandchildren. And I, I want you to think about today that think about what our generation is suffering because of those who lived before us. You know, some of us are old enough to remember uh, the 60s and the rebellion era and, and all those things. And can I give you a very, very serious and sad thought? If Jesus tarries is coming, what's the next generation going to face? Because of our sin. Because here's the thing. What we're doing. What they did even 20 and 30 years ago. Makes what they did even. What we're doing today rather. Makes what they did 20 or 30 years ago. Look like a Sunday school picnic. Amen. We are just full steam ahead in the sin. Yeah. And think about that. And But we don't think about that do we? I'm talking about people in, in general. We only think about well. I'll justify it today. And, and we look at today. But we need to remember that as a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Mm -hmm. And we know that David, 
here is he said he wanted to be a man of integrity. Now, we're well aware that David was not a, a sinless man. We're well aware of his sin with Bathsheba, the adultery that he committed with her. We're very aware of the, the pride that one time that he had of counting the people and going against God and doing that. But here in this particular case, uh, that David was innocent of that of this particular sin. As I already said, the background here is that this was uh, the sin of his predecessor uh, and King uh, Saul. Heard an interesting story though this week, and uh, I, I don't know about you, I, I enjoy history, and uh, especially if it correlates with uh, scripture and things of that sort, uh, it's enjoyable. And so this may be enjoyable to you. That in the 1680s. There was a king in France. His name was Louis the Fourteenth. He had all the Protestant preachers removed from the country. Now I'll say this: uh, you know that's back when uh, Protestants were Protestants, amen. But anyways, uh, and with them gone, their children, the French children, would be taken and given to the Catholics and taught by the Catholics Catholicism. Bible believers tried to flee. Many of them were tortured. Many of them were killed. But some did escape to a country named Switzerland. And historians tell us, and I want you to look at Psalm 26, that as they escaped, they sang Psalm 26. And, be, and, and, and they said, especially verses 8 through 11, which says, Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house. And a place where thine honor dwelleth. Gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men. In whose hands is mischief, and their right hand is full of bribes. But as for me, I will walk in mine integrity. Redeem me, and be merciful to me. I want to preach a little bit tonight about integrity. And, and you know, the truth of the matter is, uh, I want you to think about that word for a moment. And I want you to think about this. When's the last time you even heard that word mentioned on television or even among among people in the world you, i mean let's just be honest that's a word you don't even that's a word you don't even hear anymore right. about a person of uh integrity let me say this about integrity nobody not one person not one person not one person can take your integrity away from you Amen. now you can give it up yes but nobody can take. You say, well, you know, so and so, you don't understand, preacher. They took no, 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 no. You gave it up, but nobody can take your integrity. You can give it up, but you cannot, uh, but nobody can take it from you unless you give it up of yourself. Now, the word integrity means to be whole or complete. To be whole or complete. Let's remind ourselves that Satan is looking in every single one of our lives. For a place. Mm -hmm. That's why we need integrity. We need to be whole and complete because I can promise you when you when whatever place that is, Satan will find that place sooner or later. Now, integrity has the idea of being what we should be in the eyes of God. You see, integrity doesn't have to do with what people think about you. Integrity has to do with what God knows about you. Amen. That's a person of integrity. Now, turn with me, if you would, to Colossians chapter number two. And let me say this. The only way to be whole is through Jesus Christ, period. As you go back in your mind how many times Jesus said to people, will thou be made whole? You see, Jesus Christ has cornered the market on integrity and being made whole. If you strive to be uh, a person of integrity in your own strength, can I save you the time and tell you, you will utterly fail. You cannot be whole and you cannot be complete without the Lord Jesus Christ. The only way to be whole is Christ. Colossians chapter two, verse number 10. And I have under, these underlined in my Bible where the Bible says here, and ye are complete in who? In him. Amen? Does it say you're complete in yourself? No. Does it say you're complete in, in your church? No. You're complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. 
You're in Colossians 2, turn the page. Or at least for me, it's turning the page. Colossians chapter 4, verse number 12. Colossians 4, verse number 12. says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers. Notice this, and I have this underlined in my Bible. That he may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Boy, isn't that a good goal, amen? To stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Hey, folks, that is God's desire for you. I hope it's your desire for yourself. To stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. I've already told you there's only been one person who's ever lived the Christian life. And his name is Jesus. And if it's lived at your house or if it's lived at my house, and it won't be me, it'll be Christ in me and Christ in you. He is the only one. And so we can, and people say that, well, preacher, I just can't do that. Well, you're only half right. You're, you're right. You can't. But you left off the best part. He can. Amen? And he will. All you have to do is let him. All right, we can stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. In our country, and sadly in many of our churches, we have what some people would refer to as lowered the flag. Mm. Brother Emery talks about that a lot of times. Uh, every time I talk to Brother Emery, he said, he said, I appreciate, I praise the Lord, not, not bragging on us, but bragging on the Lord. He said, I appreciate your church hasn't lowered the flag. Now, that just means, that just means that uh, a place is still trying to have Bible standards mm -hmm. and, and, and standards according to uh, the word of God. And the sad thing is, is that even in many churches today, people aren't even being challenged. People aren't even being challenged in this area of integrity. All right. We have and we have a Christianity today uh, that people want that is costless. It is crossless. It is faithless. And folks, listen, it is not biblical. It is not biblical Christianity. All right? There ought to be something wonderful. and There ought to be something precious about the word Christian. <coughs> Christian. That ought to mean something. Folks, listen, that, that's a, that's a three-set word anymore. Everybody's a Christian. We just throw that around everything, don't we? We just throw it around. But listen, that ought to mean something. Amen. No, it means something. People just flippantly use that today. Let's remind ourselves professing is not enough. All right? And if we are true Christians, we are true Christians, we will be people of integrity. We will be people of integrity because we are going to be Christ-like. That's what our Christian means. Christ-like. And Christ, of course, is the, the height, the zenith of integrity. I'll say this, we're people of integrity. Our word will mean something. I was talking to a, our HR person today, and uh, she was saying that at five interviews today, only one of them showed up, and the other four didn't even bother calling mm -hmm. and saying they weren't going to come. And that's she was saying. She's a, uh, an older lady. I, don't know how, I won't guess her age, amen. But, uh, you know, where's integrity today? Our, our word will mean something. We're people of integrity. Our lives will show something if we're people of integrity. We must by live and by life be unashamedly identified with Jesus Christ. Now go with me, if you would, in the Old Testament to the book of Job, chapter 2. We talked about old Job on Sunday morning. But Job, chapter 2, Job was a great man, a great example of integrity. And you think, and again, you say, well, preacher, you know, I had this go on and that go on and, you know, it just kind of, you know, lost my integrity, and that's my excuse. Hey, friend, if anybody ever had an excuse uh, to give up the integrity, it would have been Job. Again, you've never been through what Job's been through. I've never been through what Job's been through. And after he went through all that he went through, it says in Job chapter 2, verse 3, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil, and notice this, and still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. 
I mean, he totally lost his wealth. He totally lost his health. All of his kids are dead. His wife says, curse God and die. I mean, all, all that he went through, I, 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 mean, I, I, I mean, physical pain, financial loss, lost his children, lost it all. And Job still kept his integrity. Praise God. And we have what? We can as well. Go with me to Job chapter 31. Job chapter 31 for, for just a moment. I want you, I want to read verses 1 through 6. Job 31 verses 1 through 6. And I want you to look at verse number 1. We talked about refrigerator verses. Hey, how about Job 31 1 for a computer, a verse to put on your computer or your phone or your television set. Job 31 1, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? For what portion of God is there from above? And what inheritance of Almighty from on high? He is not destruction to the wicked and a strange punishment to the workers of iniquity. Doth not he see my ways and count all my steps? If I have walked with vanity or if my foot hath hastened to deceit, let me be weighed in an even balance, Job says, that God may know mine, notice it, mine integrity. Mine integrity. Job said it is important for me for God to see me as a man of integrity. And I ask you a question tonight. Does being a person of integrity mean something to you? It should. It should. Uh, that, uh, that I am and you are who we appear to be. God will enable us. Amen. That's what I'm preaching about tonight for a few moments. God will uh, enable us. And here is uh, David here in Psalm 26. Uh, the nation is in judgment. People are looking for somebody to blame. And David prayed to the Lord. And he said, God, in this trial and this time, help me to be a man of integrity. And when you're going through something, you're going through a trial, hardship, whatever it is, you ought to pray, God, help me to be faithful. Help me to be a person of integrity. Help me to be whole and complete in this time in my life. Now, notice some, some thoughts here from Psalm 26. If you turned away, let's go to Psalm 26 and notice some thoughts here tonight. Number one, I notice the openness of a life of integrity. The openness of a life of integrity. Look at verse one. Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord. Therefore, I shall not slide. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins. And my heart. May I say the integrity of life is not one of hiding. It is not one of deceit. It is not one of hypocrisy. David said, examine me. And by the way, examine me thoroughly. You ever go to the doctor and say, uh, doc, give me a thorough examination. All right. And that's what David is saying here. Lord, thoroughly examine me. Lord, is there anything in my life that's not right? anything the thorough exam when you think about the animals that they brought in the old testament times to be sacrificed those priests would examine those lambs and don't don't, don't miss this not only would they examine the outside they'd also examine the inside the priest would examine it inside and out because it could not be offered to god with any blemish whatsoever kind of reminds me of paul doesn't it Lord, I want to be a living sacrifice, holy. And I've said before, holy, H-O-L-Y, is very closely akin to W-H-O-L-L-Y. Totally and completely, integrity, holy, and accept, accept the one to God, which is our reasonable service. Listen, this is a serious thing. I think we'd be shocked at how many <clears throat> Christians think that it's okay to Cheat a little. To rob a little. You know, well, it was a white lie. I'm sorry, I don't read about white lies in the Bible. How about a little guile? Well, whatever it is. Hey, listen, a person of integrity doesn't do that. No, a life of integrity is an open life to God. And notice what he says. Verse number two, God judge me. God examine me. God, look at me. You know, the reason we need to do that is we can't do that ourselves. We all have blind spots, mm -hmm. right? 
We need to God. We need God's word and God to do that. Lord, is there anything in my life that's not right with you? The openness of a life of integrity. Let me give you a second thought this evening, and that is the obedience of a life of integrity. The obedience. Look at verse three. He says, "For thy loving kindness is before mine eyes, and I have walked in thy truth." All right. Again, uh, here you say, Lord, I want to be right with you. I want to walk in your truth. Again, David was not perfect, but aren't you glad for first John one nine? If we confess our sins, amen. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we can, with God's help, live lives of obedience. May I say this because we have failures does not mean, hallelujah, that we have to become failures. Amen. I'm glad for that tonight. You say, well, preacher, you don't know what I've done. No, but God does, and he's ready to forgive. Amen. In the blood of Jesus Christ, God said, hallelujah, cleanseth us from how much sin? All sin. Amen for that. If you want to be a person of integrity, live a life of obedience to God. A Christian who is in willful disobedience to God and his word is not a person of integrity. Parents who lack integrity, may I say, it will manifest itself in their children. Because more is caught than it is taught. Notice David's motivation in verse 3. I love this. I wish I had a whole time to preach on this. I need to mark that and come back and preach the whole message on verse 3. Because he says, For thy loving kindness is before mine eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. You know, you know what will help you walk in truth? Understanding God's been good to you. Yeah. Understanding his loving kindness. That, that, ought to be, that ought to be the motivation of all of us. God sure has been good. How can I not love him? How can I not serve him? Romans chapter number two, verse four says the goodness of God leads us to repentance. I believe a person gets a hold of the loving kindness of God and loves the Lord like they should. Listen, you won't have to beg them to read their Bible. You won't have to beg them to pray. You won't have to beg them to come to church. You won't have to beg them to be a witness. You won't have to beg them to live a separated life. By just doing one thing, loving the Lord. The loving kindness. Notice, notice, the, notice the order there. For thy loving kindness is before mine eyes. And listen, that was ever before him. Boy, God's been good. Boy, God's been good. Boy, God's been good. Boy, God's been good. And the natural outflow of that's the end of the verse. I walked in that truth. Can I tell you? God's been better to every person in this room than you deserve. Yes. Can I tell you a trick of the devil? To get you focused on one bad thing. Mm -hmm. And there's a million things around you that God has blessed you with. Man, there is, there is something there. And man, and you can't see, you can't see the million things because you're just focused on that one thing. Just consume with it. No, listen, get your eyes on the loving kindness of God and the outflow of that will be will walk in his truth. Number three, the overcoming of a life of integrity. The overcoming of a life of integrity. Look at verse number four. He says, I have not sat with vain persons. Neither will I go in with dissemblers. The word dissemblers has the idea of hypocrites. Verse five, I have hated the congregation of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. The evildoers here are those who Deliberately try to destroy what is good. And we should be moved against evil. Amen. A religion, quote unquote, that never raises its voice against sin is not a biblical Christianity. Right. <clears throat> we have people today who are deliberately trying to destroy what is good. Listen, friend, it is the work of God to put together. It is the work of sin and Satan to tear apart. And it's true in every front. Look at verse 6. I will wash mine hands in innocency. 
so will I compass thine altar, O Lord. Notice separation and sanctification there. And let her just remind you tonight that sanctification and separation does not start from the world. It starts to the Lord. To the Lord and then from the world. It is not enough to say, I'm not, you know, and people say this, well, I don't do this, and I don't do that, and I don't do this, and I don't do that. Well, okay, well, what do you do? You see, it's to the Lord. This is what I do for the Lord. Because I love the Lord, this is what I do. Oh, yeah, and because of that, what I do for the Lord, then I don't do those things. Amen. You see the difference? You see the difference, all right? Now, I wish I had time preaching all these more, more but let me give you number four, the overflowing. The overflowing of a life of integrity. Look at verse 7. I love this. He says that I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving. And tell of all thy wondrous works. Mm -hmm. And I ask you, well, what'd you. When's the last time you just bragged on the Lord? Told all of his, all of his wondrous works. Telling about what Jesus has, has done for. All that he has done for you. See when. When we get right with the Lord and that life of integrity, man, and you start realizing all the Lord's done for you, it'll just be the outflow. It really is. You ever get it? You ever see somebody? Uh, you know, it, it could be a, a million different things, but uh, you know, you find someone, whatever their subject is. You know, you find a you find a guy who likes uh, brother brother Ray Hilger. You know, a couple of guys that like old cars. And you, there's some guys, man, they can just talk about old, old cars. To, I mean, right? You know, because that's their thing, right? It's just their consuming thing. You know what? We ought to be consumed with Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Now, just be the outflow of our lives. Now, num number five, let me give you this number five, verses eight and nine. Notice the obstruction of a life of integrity. Verse eight, he says, Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house and a place where thine honor dwelleth. <coughs> Gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men. You know what David's saying here? He said, I want some obstacles in my life. I want some speed bumps. I want some things that will stop me from doing wrong things. Look at verse number 10. David describes them. He says, in whose hands is mischief, and their right hand is full of bribes. Verse number 9, he says, gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men. You know, kind of sounds like Matthew 6, 13 to me, where, where, where Jesus told us to pray, lead us not into temptation. Amen. Listen, lead, lead not my life, verse number nine, uh, with sinners and, and, and bloody men. Now, many have climbed barriers to get into sin. Can I tell you those barriers are God's love and mercy? Saying, don't do that. Don't do that. Can I remind us tonight? God will send his word. God will send his messenger to warn us. And I can I tell you that a man of integrity wants accountability. A man or a woman of, of integrity wants accountability. And you know what? They want standards. And they want obstacles. They want things. I talked to you uh, uh, this evening about Job 31. Set, setting no, uh, I, I've made a covenant with my eyes. Are you listening to this preacher? That lady knows every single one of my passwords. You know why? Because we share the same passwords. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because I want obstacles in my life. Amen. 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 These people say, well, you know, and I've met, I've met men. Oh, well, I don't, I, don't share my, I don't share my passwords with my wife. I, I, got, I got these secret things. I got things on my computer my wife doesn't know about. Mr. You're having in trouble. Yeah. Or already there. A man of integrity wants obstacles. Instead of complaining about them. We, go, man, we have a whole world today that just complains about standards all the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Instead of complaining about them, you ought to be thanking God for them. Amen. Yeah. Thank God for them. They keep us from not going where we should. Amen to that. Amen. Now, number six, and finally this evening, the orderliness of a life of integrity. You see, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Listen, and I realize, and, and, and there's two dishes on this. 
You know, they're so, you know, well, well, we're so ordered that we ordered the Holy Spirit out of it. That's wrong. But this come see, come sigh, I'll do whatever. That's also wrong. Yeah. The steps of a good man are ordered. Verse number 11, but as for me, I will walk in mine integrity. Redeem me and be merciful unto me. My foot standeth in an even place. In the congregations will I bless the Lord. Listen, a life of integrity is a life of orderliness, not happenstance. Now I'm done, but I'll say this before I'm done. Men and women want to be married to a person who is a person of integrity. There's no peace of mind for a spouse who is not married to someone who is a person of integrity. Amen. You want to give a gift to your spouse? Be a person of integrity. Can I say this? Parents want children of integrity. Yes. And can I say this? Children need parents of integrity. There's no peace. I said there's no peace for a spouse. There's no peace for kids who have parents who are not people of integrity. Right. Now, if you have lost your integrity, you can regain it. Praise God. Amen. 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 You think Paul finished with some pretty good integrity? Yes. I believe he did. He didn't start off with a lot of integrity, did he? But he certainly finished it. God has made it possible to regain it. I think we just need to say, God, I want to, I would just want to take that as my prayer. I will walk with your help, Lord, in my integrity. And really, it starts. It's all about the Lord, as it always is. And say, Lord, I am open, totally open to you. Show me anything. Show me anything. Examine me. Look, he said in verse 2, examine me, O Lord. Prove me. Try my reins and my heart. Lord, what don't I see? Well, what have I excused? Well, what have I justified? What have I had a blind spot on? Lord, if there's anything, you show me how. You know what? God will give us that integrity and he'll make us whole. Praise God. Let's bow, bow for a word of prayer this evening. Our heads